Can you imagine a future when thousands of humans are actually living in space? It's right around the corner. Today we're going to talk about one of the pioneers of habitats in space, Gerard K. O'Neill. Three, two, one. Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Thanks so much for joining me today. In today's episode, we dive into the details of a new award-winning documentary about inspirational physics professor Jerry K. O'Neill. Jerry was a Princeton University professor who changed the face of space exploration during the 70s and 80s with his plans for building human colonies in space. His innovative ideas inspired many, including Johnny Carson and Isaac Asimov. Producer Will Henry joins us today to discuss the new film, The High Frontier, The Untold Story of Gerard K. O'Neill. Your Space Journey. Life is extraordinarily rare, extraordinarily precious. Opening the high frontier means making possible and ensuring the survival of the human race. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. I have to admit, I absolutely loved the new documentary, The High Frontier, The Untold Story of Gerard K. O'Neill. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about Jerry and what led your team to do this documentary on him. Yeah, well, there's so many good answers there, but I think the, the best way to describe Jerry is that he is the unsung hero of what we know of, of as today as the new space movement. Um, yeah. He effectively wrote the handbook on space colonization and anybody who's anybody doing anything in this industry at this moment would at some point credit their career to being inspired uh, or having Jerry as a mentor. Um, so, but Jerry was um, most known for, uh, of course, writing the High Frontier, the book, um, yeah. and the movement that followed that. Um, but previously, he was a Princeton physics professor. Um, he's uncredited for the invention of the particle storage ring, which is what makes particle accelerators work. That blew um, me away. That was such a fascinating piece of information. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then designed the, uh, the precursor to GPS. So he's got a wow. lot going for him. And, uh, but he's obviously most known for writing The High Frontier and uh, the movement he started. See, and that, that was amazing too, because your documentary just does a great job of talking about just how much impact he has. And again, you mentioned this book, uh, for those out there, it was called The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space. How cool is that? Written several decades ago, but it made an incredible impact. Um, I was wondering, just, just for our viewers out there and listeners, um, how would you describe the space habitats that Jerry envisioned, such as the O'Neill Cylinders? It's a great question because his concept permeated all of what we know of as space colonies, space settlements, space habitats over the last four decades. Um, and so if you've ever seen anything that looks like a lar like a giant long pill, like something you would take orally for, a, for an, a, an ailment or something like a pill, um, that's the best description I can come up with for it. Um, typically there were two in two at a time that would be connected by thin structures and they so that you could travel from one to the other and then they would spin at a speed um to create uh what we consider 1g gravity what we have here on the earth and so they'd be shaped like these large pills but inside it would actually it would, uh, it, the uh colony would be inside of that structure um almost in an upside uh, an inside out world almost and we would live inside with uh, breathable air See, I thought that was incredible. Your documentary does a wonderful job of, of showing those visually. It's, it's just so beautiful. I mean, there's, there's green grass. There's people just having fun, frolicking in space in these awesome habitats. I think that's awesome. Um, what, one thing, too, that I wanted to get into, you, know, you mentioned the book, um, but the documentary, I, I was amazed. I, I mean, you said that people were inspired, but um, even Jeff Bezos talks about how he read Jerry's book when he was young and it influenced him. And of course, now he's making those dreams come true with Blue Origin. Um, as your team, you were making this documentary. 
what surprised you the most or who surprised you most about those who Jerry inspired? Oh, gosh, that is a great question. Um, I think, you know, when we decided to make this film, we knew that there were a lot of people inspired by Jerry O'Neill. And but yeah. once we started putting in the war, we we almost had to put up, a, you know, like a stop coming and knocking on our door sign because That's it was awesome. just everybody in the industry was like, well, I'm so glad you're you know, we, we at the beginning thought, well, we got to finish this quickly because things are happening so quickly. Everyone's, someone else is going to make a movie about this guy. So we had to finish it, but, you know, we took our time and for very good reasons, it took us about three years to make. Um, and uh, it was just as relevant, if not more relevant by the time we finished it, yeah. um, which was great. Um, I say the thing, the people that were the, what surprised me the most, I mean, you know, when looking back, it was obvious that it was the Star Trek generation. It was, yeah. you know, <laughs> Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, right? Yeah, yourself. Um, uh, Peter Diamandis of the X Prize. Um, nice. Uh, Lori Garver, who was the deputy administrator of NASA under uh, under Obama. Um, and I mean, obviously, the list went on and on. Um, I think the person that surprised me the most, and this is in the film. Um, oh God, I'm picking between two people. I, <laughs> That's okay. Um, we have room for two. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm just going to go with it. Timothy Leary. Um, uh-huh. And well, I guess, you know, I, maybe that's not as surprising because it's like he was in a way he would have obviously he would have been interested in this, yeah. but he wasn't just interested in it. He went out there and promoted it and used his platform not to talk about himself. There got to a point where there was like five years where he stopped talking about his own ideas and was only talking about Gerard O'Neill's ideas, wow. um, which was incredible. And, but you know what, actually, I think I have a better answer and it was Ronald Reagan. Wow. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was a huge uh, of what uh, Gerard and, or rather Jerry was doing um, and, and placed him on the uh, national commission on space that, uh, for, for, uh, for a couple of years um, and wow. was a huge fan of his work. Yeah. See, that, that just blows me away. I, I mean, again, as you're walking the documentary, I just had no, idea how many people he influenced and it's still going on today. And one thing I have to admit, um, this kind of, this kind of bugged me about just not Jerry, but our past, um, during the Apollo moon landings, I was just a toddler. So I don't remember this, but I remember seeing the TV shows of, uh, the astronauts, you know, landing, walking on the moon and there were protests, you know, many critics, you know, why are we going into space when there's so many things we have to fix around here? And well, here it is, you know, 50 plus years later, <laughs> Have we solved all of our problems yet? Um, you know, I, I personally, like my opinion counts, I think we need to we need to push the envelope. We need to go there because it's going to bring us up as, as a human race, as a species itself. But Jerry experienced that during his time. Long story short, um, I learned in your documentary that uh, even Jerry's students at Princeton were growing cynical uh, about the benefits of science uh, during the Vietnam War was going on. But what I loved is that Jerry posed this important question to some of his students. He says, is the surface of a planet really the right place for an expanding technological civilization? Right. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, 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 when you talk about Jerry's legacy, um, that's the question that changed everything. You know, um, you look at a lot of successful people and there's little moments in their lives. You know, everybody's going on different paths every day. Everyone finds a new fork on the road every single day. And yeah. he found one that made a profound impact. And it was, like you said, it was, he, he was aware that his students were becoming cynical. He was aware that technologists were being blamed for war. Um, right. We invented, uh, scientists invented uh, napalm bombing. We invented the, the hydrogen bomb and the atomic bombs. And, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And um, he, he decided, I'm going to take the percentage of, of the 1% of my class that's achieving a little bit higher than everybody else, ask them really hard questions and let them y- use the question to learn physics um, and make them feel like they were making a profound impact on the world. And that was the question. He, ha- he asked a number of questions of his students. And I don't know this for sure, but my, my personal guess is that he anticipated those students to come back and say, um, the right place is on the surface of a planet, not in free space, to prove him wrong. Um, but they, they proved him right. Um, and it was that it was, you know, going to places like, such as L4 and L5, these Lagrangian points with uh, right. 
stable gravitational poles in space and and build there. And uh, it just it's incredible that that one question. I'm sure a lot of people were thinking it at the time. It was 1969. We just landed on the moon. Right. Who's going to ask that question and prove everybody wrong when we've spent so much money going to the moon? Why would we think of something else? And it was the right question, ironically. You know, it was. And what was fascinating to me is, um, you know, Jerry obviously seemed way ahead of his time. I mean, just incredibly ahead of his time because right now our culture actually finally, thank goodness, seems to be embracing the thought of, yes, let's become a multi plant species. Um, why do you think that is? Happening um, you know, I think that we've gotten to the point where government isn't the one spending all the money. Um, and I think that because we can look at, you know, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, um, and, and quite a number of companies now, in, especially in the United States, mm -hmm. who are spending, you know, billions on this. Yeah. You know? um, because it's companies like that that have proved us beyond the what's the mysterious figure in the dark. They've proved that they can land two boosters at once and reuse them. They've proved that the money is not a waste. Um, and over time, the history has shown us that things like going to the moon gave us better calculators for better education, which Absolutely. doesn't have to be about space. And so, you know, and, 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 you know, there's many examples like that, but I think that people are finally realizing that, you know, uh, I, I like to think that we are in a better place today than we were before, even though I know that many of our problems around the world, especially things like our limits to growth, but also things like climate and, um, and, and our resources are dwindling. Um, I think some people are realizing, okay, let's <laughs> let these really rich people kind of mess around and maybe solve something. Um, and on some things they have, and on some things they've been a little bit embarrassing. The good thing is that it's not the government wasting time uh, doing it, um, because I know I get upset when the government spends too much time on something I don't agree with. Right. Um, and the space is just a very polarizing issue, surprisingly. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's just it. The government isn't the one doing it. It's just regular Joes who have tons of money. <laughs> <laughs> See, but it is true. And again, just again, it, it's all. Jerry's impact. I mean, he's influenced a lot of these people. Like you said, yeah. one thing I did want to jump back to the documentary, because again, what I, I, I've always been a big Johnny Carson fan. I understand he loved astronomy while well, he also really enjoyed, and he had Jerry on his show. Um, but what really surprised me is I didn't realize this, but uh, foundation fans will love this, but one of my favorite sci-fi writers, Isaac Asimov was actually a very strong supporter of Jerry and a lot of the documentary, it shows Isaac with Jerry um, presenting Jerry's case. I thought it was cool. So what well, can you tell just our audience, how did Isaac Asimov um, become connected with Jerry? It's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm not entirely certain how, you know, how they met, but I'm not surprised. I, I'm sure that, you know, this is pre uh, usable internet. Um, so yeah. this was times where, you know, Jerry had a paper newsletter and he went and, he went to conferences in person. Um, and when he did that, you know, there was 10 people who were supposed to talk and those 10 people got to know each other. And I'm sure he met them at some point. And uh, you know what, I think what really, really convinced Isaac Asimov was when he realized that O'Neill's cylinders could be used to prove and implement solar power, um, which was something Isaac Asimov was immensely passionate about. Um, and I think it's one of the more uh, underrated parts of the movie, too, because it's just, you know, even if we don't build these, you know, cylinders in space, let's go out and build solar power. But regardless, the point is that I, I, Isaac Asimov joined the movement immediately, had no problem promoting him on live TV and on, on, on radio shows. Um, and uh, it was a really fun time going through all of the footage of Isaac Asimov because there is tons. We picked one. <laughs> we picked yeah. one interview with him that he talked about Jerry. It's kind of like the iconic one you've probably seen in black and white. Um, but it's it was one of many. Um, and what's uh, wonderful is that we didn't have any restriction using anything about Asimov for, you know, awesome. uh, I don't need to go down the film legal terms, but we got really lucky. Uh, I understand how hard that must have been. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm so glad that worked out because, yeah, that was that was a phenomenal interview. I'm, I'm excited, actually, that there's others out there. But again, your documentary, your whole team did a wonderful job on this. And 
from what I understand, several awards. Uh, you've won several awards. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those and, and just how's the reception been so far? Yeah, the, respect, the reception has been fantastic. And I think this is a point where I just say that, you know, I'm the person who had the time to go on a podcast because the there were so many people who helped us make this film. The film was a very small crew. Um, you know, there's really only four or five of us. Um, and I, I really have to give a shout out to, the, to that crew as well as our executive producer real quickly because first of all, Dylan Taylor is the executive producer He's um, also the founder of Voyager Space Holdings. He was the full investor of the film. This entire thing happened because of him. Um, And he actually started making the movie before any of us got involved, realized he sort of stumbled onto something big and said, I got to go out there and get some filmmakers to help me make this, which is where we came along. Um, And then we partnered with um, Subtractive Inc. in Santa Monica, California, and we... uh, that company is led by Ryan Stite, who was our director and editor, and then Kyle Schember, who was another producer on the film as well. And without without all of us, none of this would have happened. But at the same time, you know, without Dylan paying the way, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to make this thing and, and to continue following down all the rabbit holes we wanted to. Um, that said, the reception has been fantastic. Um, we... We are fully aware that this film has a very long life. Um, so, you know, we haven't had a theatrical screening because of COVID, um, but we <laughs> look forward to doing it in the future because it will still be relevant. Um, and yeah, we've been accepted so far into, I think something around 20, 25 film festivals and have won uh, awards at least half of them, um, which has been really, really humbling. Well-deserved. That's fantastic. Your team has done a wonderful job on that. Again, your site uh, to, for listeners if you want to find more information it's called the high frontier movie.com and will just just real quick how can they obviously they can't go to a theater and see it um where can they stream it it's a good question um the best place to find it at the moment is on apple tv um we will also be on amazon in the future there's a little bit of a, a hold on indie docs if if your listeners don't know um at the moment so in the future we will be back on there um, we're also on a few of the smaller platforms, Fandango Now, Voodoo Stream, uh, Microsoft Stream, and Google Play. Um, and we actually just put up DVDs and Blu-rays for pre-sales today. Um, and those will be available on September 14th of, of this year, 2021. Um, so yeah, those are the best places to find it. Oh, well, this is great. <clears throat> Again, I, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today to tell us about this fantastic documentary. Thank you so much and best of luck to you. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Will today, and I'm loving the documentary, The High Frontier, The Untold Story of Gerard K. O'Neill. If you'd like to learn more, just go to their website at thehighfrontiermovie.com. I want to thank Will for joining me today. I want to thank you for joining me as well. Again, we appreciate it if you'd share this episode with a friend or give us a like. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. God bless.